And Gus just grunts at her. He says, come on down, lady. She seems legitimately distressed that something bad is going to happen to her horse if nobody is up here looking after it. She says, what kind of I'm horse a- is it? It's it, like, that's what kind of horse? It's a, a beautiful riding horse. So it's not like a war horse. It's just no. a red okay, it's a, and like No, this is the kind of horse that just had its nails did. Okay. She calls down. I'm afraid if you turn me away, I will have to take my custom to Vandelay Incorporated. And that's yes. what you guys hear when Kevin goes and fetches you outside. So he goes, Gus just says, I'll be right back. I'm just going to get the, the rest of the, the party. <coughs> Please wait but a moment. All right. So after the boxes, I'm going to have to build a couple of hitching posts up there. <laughs> oh, no. Seeker is already heading out there looking for, like, the, the horse. And he's going to hitch it up to something using the magic lock. <laughs> so, so I'm Seeker, putting a boot on the horse. You climb up the ladder and you're doing what exactly? I'm gonna uh, wrap whatever. Like, what, does she have some kind of like fancy halter on this horse? Halter? I'm not sure what the word means a in this fancy, context. Like, like a tack, like a leather, like something, something on the horse. Sure. I mean, it's horse clothes, saddles, <laughs> bit and bridle, yeah. horseshoes, yeah, bit and bridle. That's like a. I think this is like a like a like a door chain, like like a small yeah. chain on like a door like mm-hmm. i don't think you're gonna be able to you're gonna tether have to, that to anything you're gonna have to screw each end of it into something or trick her into thinking that's what you've done you have to literally screw it yeah it's got to be screwed into the wall on one side and the door on the other or nailed affixed somehow okay no okay we're gonna need to we're gonna need to do some work on this thing so it becomes more easily usable yeah i'm gonna all <laughs> add us some screw mounts to that hitching post i have on my list so what do you do when you get to the top of the ladder all right, you're gonna need to give me a second to change my uh, to change my thinking here. <laughs> well, okay. Gus comes back up and takes the reins from her. Are you still holding the evil hand? The evil hand is is uh, in a bag. <laughs> he stuffed it down the front of his shirt. She looks very pleased when Gus comes back up. She clasps her hands together. Oh, thank you. And you must be. Don't tell me. I'm very good with names. You are the seeker in the dark. Excellent. Good work. And And you're our latest client. She says she certainly hopes so. She reaches into her saddlebags as Gus is taking the reins of the stallion. Uh, And she takes out a brown paper parcel. It's fairly big. It's maybe bowling ball size and it has some heft to it. And she asks Seeker if he can Uh, carry it for her down the ladder she doesn't have much uh experience climbing down things and she's afraid she will drop it if she tries don't don't we have a uh a basket to lift things up and down you do that's yeah okay just wondering because i couldn't remember she doesn't give any indication to having noticed it she's just gonna make seeker carry it how heavy is the parcel it's fairly heavy it's got some heft to it maybe eight ten pounds Sure. So uh, that, before that, taking the parcel, though, mm-hmm. I don't. Seeker doesn't take things from people who are far, far too uh, beautiful for their own good, without <laughs> casting detect magic first. Okay. <laughs> so Seeker's going to cast detect magic. Uh, you don't have a way of doing this covertly, do you? No. Okay. Yeah. So as you speak the words of the spell, she assures you that the item inside is highly magical and may be of great interest to you if the two of you are to do business together. And does the package pour that out? It does indeed. And I can even give you a school of magic if you give me one moment. Fantastic. Seeker will carry any and all magical doodads. You hop on the horse and ride where? (laughs) I'm not interested in actual horses, only quasi-real horse-like creatures. Of course. Uh, Enchantment magic. All right. And uh, does she have any other magic on her person? Oh, yes. She's wearing... uh, In fact, make an Arcana check. Actually... Oh, no, don't need to. 20. 
20? That is a straight 20. Uh, bear with me just one moment. Oh, well, that's a natural 20, so that's 27. You can see into the arcane. Man, today is my day. How? What's the highest level spell that Seeker is able to cast right now? Three? Two. Two. Does he know mage armor? Yes. Okay. Uh, casting the, spe uh, the spell, she is under the effects of that spell particularly, and one or two other spells that you're not sure of. In addition to that, you're pretty sure that some of the jewelry she's wearing, and she's not decked out. This isn't, she's not a gaudy woman. Everything she's wearing uh, is very practical and very classy, but she is wearing some nice jewelry, some precious metals, rings on her fingers, and uh, bracelets on her arms as well. Mm -hmm. And a necklace that as she stoops down to grab the first run of the ladder and climb down, you can see gingerly falls into her bosom. And then you realize you've been staring at her bosom for like four minutes. Holy shit. Does she look to be covered in any illusions? Uh, not that you can tell. Okay. But she's definitely yes. highly skilled in various types of magics. Seeker will carry the package back down. Okay. Gus, what are you doing with this horse? Uh, well, she wants me to feed it apples, right? Yeah. So I just kind of take, I reach into the bag of apples and take one out and start eating it. <laughs> so you wait until she's down at the bottom of the ladder before you do that. Yeah. Okay. And then and I'll yell, I'll yell down to Seeker. Well, hurry that up because I got to roll. <laughs> Seeker brings this beautiful elven woman into the barge, and she bows very lowly. And very gracefully to you as she comes in. And she introduces herself as Daisy Mary. And she hopes in time that she becomes well acquainted with all of you. And then her eyes fall on the life-size portrait hanging in your lobby. Yeah. And a smile crosses her face and says, Ah, my good friend Corio. He's the one who recommended you to me. That's... That's oh, like friend of Corio is a friend of ours. Like yeah, that sounds like a thing he would do. Thank you very much. Next time you see him, please thank him for your custom. I have a real quick question for you, which is, when he was uh, offering us to you, did he happen to use words similar to, I would consider it a great favor if they would do this? She looks a little puzzled and says, well, no. Uh, I was really hoping for that one. All right, never mind. <laughs> she says the nature of her task is very delicate. And... She needs to use people who are not well-known throughout Dunfoss, which is why she didn't take this custom to Van... Everybody knows Vandalay. If you have an investigative task that needs doing... How does the jingle go? I can't really remember. So, she can't go for the, for the highest tier of detectives in the city. And that's when her good friend Corio recommended you guys. However, it's a little unorthodox and if we are to do business there has to be a great deal of trust between all of us yeah i mean no i agree i was actually just telling my companions earlier today about the value of truth and honesty and she claps her hands and looks over at kevin who's still standing at the door still kind of pouting and still wearing the hat it says Send your lad to fetch us some wine, and we shall converse. And Seeker will kind of make a motion towards the door. Yeah, Alexander will go over to Kevin, take take his hat back, put it on, light a cigarette, <laughs> sit down behind the desk. Give Kevin a quick finger gun and use that to uh, <laughs> send him the message. Feel free to have your, some for yourself too, Kevin. <laughs> Kevin is a minor I do not approve After those goddamn barnacle leeches He just keeps a jug of whiskey under his pillow at all times <laughs> Speaker as he makes the finger gun Starts to Thinks in his head Oh god I need to just start doing this all the time So nobody can tell when I'm messaging people <laughs> Gus is a genius <laughs> Daisy Neri Deba Debatable wh Where do you guys take the conversation to? She insists on the most comfortable room 
in the bars because it's going to be a very long conversation. One of the things she's heard about Flump Inc. is that there are five members plus the errand boy and the uh, receptionist who she has little interest in. Four of the members she's been told are skilled spellcasters, and then they have their fighting man. Uh, I'd suggest my office because it's set up for me to sit dramatically behind the counter and smoke. Okay, very good. Uh, you actually say that out loud because it's no. really. <laughs> we all know. We all know the reason. Yeah, we all. You all know exactly why Alex laid it out the way he did. But yeah. he also has a couple extra couches. So. Yeah, it also happens to be convenient. So, guys, what are you doing up there with the horse? Just waiting until she I... comes back. I'm staring it at it. Does it get any apples, it. or do you eat all the apples? No, I'm eating all the apples. This is not <laughs> Gus does not like animals. So here's the thing about apples, is there are like extremely tart crab apples, like barely edible things that you can get for a copper or two out in the streets. That's what Gus is accustomed to. That's what you figure you feed a horse. Nope, these are like honey crisp, delicious, just juicy, just runs down your chin. Like, they belong in a pie, and that pie belongs in your face, apples. I'm right. having a great time. <laughs> what and started like, out as spy it is turning into lunch. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's a good point. So I'm just eating apples and throwing the cores over the... I'm hucking the cores as far away as I can. Uh, Lucius, as you're speaking yes. with Daisy Neri, um, she's speaking common... And she has no inflection in her voice and no accent whatsoever that give you the uh, any indication that she speaks Sand Elf. This is very strange, especially to you. Your family comes from the area because Sand Elves are known to be nomads that keep to themselves unto many generations past. Seeing one dressed like this, wearing riding clothes, riding a stallion through the city of Dunfoss on the wrong side of the ocean. It's rare enough to see a sylvan elf in the city. To see a sand elf mm-hmm. is completely unheard of. And a sand elf that carries herself like this is another layer of completely unheard of. She tells you that she has a mind to bring her great wealth and her magical acumen to the city of Dunfoss and seek a new fortune here. She's seeking a new start in her life. However, she understands that to do that, Dunfoss has very bizarre rules about noble lineages and family names, and alas, she has neither. So, she needs to marry a man in Dunfoss and take his name. Okay. Which would then put her in charge of his house, and... When he dies, as mortals are wont to do, she would find herself in that position of power where she can grow her fortune peaceably. And I'm assuming your good friend Corio isn't interested. Corio is far too young, for one thing. He's not likely to die in the next 10 or 20 years. Uh, Certainly not likely to will his fortune to me when he does die. And really, what do you know about Corio's uh, Corio's family? Who who would his heir be, if you don't mind me asking? She says that it's her understanding that you, Flump Inc., are trying to ascertain that. That's well, why we, he's we're, we're trying to work his lineage backwards. We haven't done any work forward. And she looks slightly annoyed. She says, I'm, "Are we here to discuss my job or Corio's?" Yeah, I, th- I think, I think, I think that's not relevant to her business. So I think We're more we than happy to listen to your job. It's just, we can hardly allow an avenue of information about one of our other jobs to pass by without quickly asking. You can see that's the sort of conscientiousness that we bring to our everyday work. Make a persuasion check. That's a 20. <laughs> <laughs> she seems very pleased by what she has heard. She has... Well, here, here's her pitch over the course of many glasses of wine. She has three criteria that she considers to be good candidates for a husband in Dunfoss. Uh, four, technically, because there's a zeroth criteria that he has to be a wealthy nobleman who sits the Council of Lords. 
Okay. Which is basically any nobleman in Dunfoss. Uh, he has to be in decent health, but of an age that he only has 10 to 20 years less. This way she can avoid any scandal. When he dies of old age, nobody will say, oh, the, the elf came along and poisoned him. If, if she's his uh, loyal wife for 10 or 20 years or so, and then he dies peaceably, happily in his old age, the transition will be all the smoother. Okay. Uh, he needs to have no children or other strong claims to his wealth when he dies. Otherwise, sure. that could get very messy very quickly. And not to disparage mortal kind, but I just, I have no great love of your children. Mm-hmm. And third, she wants somebody who's not strongly tied to any of Dunfoss's magic colleges. Okay. Uh, I, I have to point out, you didn't say anything about his personality or appearance. She says these are inconsequential things. All right. These are things that, uh, what she needs to happen, though, is she needs to learn this man's identity without giving anybody in Dunfoss the indication that she's been shopping around. That's where you come in. You've got to do okay. this on the down low. Uh, she's uh. going to pay... She offers 200 gold pieces for a list of potential names and 300 more upon successful marriage to one of the men on the list. How do you spell her name? Daisy Neri. I'll let you spell it however you want. She says her good friends call her Daisy. Well, Daisy. I must admit I've never played matchmaker before. This is new territory for me. You said that you don't want the city to hear about you going around. Do you care if your prospective fiancé knows anything about your interest in the arrangement? She says all she wants is... A list of possible candidates. Just find noblemen of that age with few chil- few or no living children and who are not strongly tied to any of the magic colleges. Once she knows who they are, then she can worry about uh, what they know and when they learn it and how all that plays out. All right. Uh, one last question. Uh, you mentioned that you need them to be a nobleman on the council of lords and that you'd like them to be wealthy is the wealthy as important or would you be ex- all right with a nobleman who has the name but not the money given that you yourself seem to have some personal wealth she says that this uh because she intends to live in this man's house for maybe 10 or 20 years though that's a small fraction of the amount of time that she has to engross herself in Dunfoss and politics, it is still a large amount of time to live without a lady's comforts. She will need the man to be wealthy. Alex kind of quietly crosses off the was his name that was on his notebook. (laughs) Lord was name. (laughs) She asks if this task is within the, uh, within the skill set of Flump Inc., what sort of timetable are you looking to receive this list? She says she's in absolutely no hurry. She's in absolutely no rush whatsoever. Good. We'll do our best not to keep you waiting, but these things can take time. At this point, she lays her hand on top of the brown paper parcel that seekers carry down. Mm-hmm. She says, if we are to enter into this contract, I want you all to be very aware of what you're doing. And you notice that at this point in the conversation, a lot of this air of nobility starts to fall away from her. She says, if people found out precisely what is going on, it's possible you would make enemies, as would I. In fact, it's possible I already have enemies in Dunfoss. Because this may get dangerous... It is important to me to explain why it may get dangerous. At the same time, entrusting my secrets to people that I come at high recommendation, but who I have not worked with yet, is itself a form of risk. And she starts to open the parcel. 
inside is a bronze square box. It doesn't look like it has hinges or a lid. Uh, Seeker, you're the one who carried it. It definitely felt empty. There's no way it's solid metal all the way through. Mm-hmm. Four of the sides of the box are just smooth bronze, but one side, her right hand, is a bronze ear fashioned into the box. And on the opposite face are a pair of tightly closed bronze lips. What did she do to this poor Modron? <laughs> right. okay. so sorry. <laughs> she says that in order to enter this contract with you, she's going to have to share with you a secret that even her beloved Corio does not know about her. And before she is comfortable doing that, she needs to collect secrets from at least two members of Flump Inc. And she describes the magic on this box. If you speak into the ear, the box will know if you speak the truth. If you are, it will keep the secret without telling anybody. If the day comes when you try to harm her with the information that you know about her, she has the method of excising your secrets from the box to in turn be used against you. It's a form of insurance, she says. If you'd like to take the time to identify the box to know that I'm telling you how its function is true, I completely understand. Yeah, and Seeker will take the box and begin casting Identify. Okay, what's well, uh, Alex's question? I was literally about to ask her if she, if she would mind if we did that. <laughs> and you wait patiently while she has another glass of wine. And uh, not only does the box function exactly like she said it will, but you also learn the command word to pull secrets out of the box. Okay. So if you were to speak the command word, you don't learn what's inside by casting identify, but if you speak the command word, what will happen is the box will begin speaking the last secret it was told. Are the secrets that are currently stored in the box the ones that you will be telling us as part of our job? She shakes her head no. All right. And how will we know that your secret is true? She holds her arm out and clenches her fist. And the complexion of her arm is pale with like a tinge of orange as though the sun has scorched it. And she runs her fingernails from her wrist down to her elbow. And it's like she's scraping something away. And the orange pale flesh comes away like sand. And underneath you see the ashy gray arm of a dark elf. Oh. I mean, I would have mentioned that she trusted us enough to learn the, the command word to use the box, so Do we didn't need that. But... Does her hand size look like that of a human's? <laughs> uh, no, smaller and more slender than a human's. And she okay. has both of her hands. Secret is just making sure that they didn't actually find a dark elf hand. So she now asks saw a gray hand. Before she goes any further, she will require that two members of Flump Inc., in privacy, of course, where they cannot be overheard, make use of this box. Whisper something into it that only they know. So it can't be something that we've shared with our companions? She asks if this is a thing that your companions know, but which would be damaging to you if anybody else found out. Yes. Lucia steps forward. <laughs> okay. And Seeker will, will go with Lucius. So you guys are going into the other room? Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, we can use my office for there's this. A, there's a curtain for that. <laughs> Lucius gestures across the hall from his office to the, uh, to the other office, which... So screen. Lucius and Seeker are going to use the box? Yeah. Okay. Seems Lucius. Delicious. <laughs> They're the best apples ever. 
Yes. Lucius, what do you whisper into the bronze box's ear? You should know the secret by now, Brick Road. You've only been reminding me about it for like six sessions. What, that your balls haven't dropped yet? No. That Lucius, that Lucius allowed a woman to be arrested in his stead. What kind of woman? <laughs> That's an important part of the secret, I feel. Yeah, no, no, you're right. And what? Yeah, no. Is she overhearing this as well? No, you guys went into another room. And I'm assuming you Seeker put up the magical curtains that yeah. we can't even hear it if we put our ear against the wall. Yeah. That's why Seeker wants to go as well. Yeah, so, yeah, I will. Yeah, no, that Lucius got got a got a got a servant servant woman at the Keyskin Embassy arrested in his stead. Wait, what kind of servant woman? Brick Road, please. Say it. Say it for I me. don't I okay. adjectives, okay? <laughs> there there are adjectives and they exist and sometimes I don't remember them all, okay? Just in a say it. Say it. Fuck's box. sake. Box sake. Seeker, what do you whisper into the bronze ear of the box? That I've angered an incredibly powerful magical dragon and might be bringing great danger down upon the city. <laughs> so, uh, I was under the impression that we did not know that you did the you the woman. The, yeah, the, we don't. We don't. We still don't. Does Seeker? Yeah, you don't. Was Seeker okay? Seeker wasn't in the so room. No, Seeker either. went first. With the box, and then whispered that into it, but in such a voice that you were still able to hear it. And then he hands you the box and just kind of looks at you, highbrow. <laughs> <laughs> Gus. Yep. Coming up the street, up the shallows, you're sitting there munching on apples. Have you shared any of these apples with the children of the shallows? Oh, yeah. If, <laughs> like, if children, yeah, no. Make an arcana check. All right. <sighs> that's a 12 there's a small compartment in the saddlebags that she instructed you i mean there's for the for uh for the horse's care like there's one of oats and there's one of apples and you're pretty sure you've pulled more apples out of this compartment than there is physical space in the saddlebag at this point right <laughs> a man calls your name from down the street, looking up, you recognize him as one of the gentleman's toughs. And he's wearing much nicer clothes than last time you work with him. The kind where, like, if poor people get, a, like, a big influx of money and they want to dress like a rich people and they buy yeah. something with, like, frilly shoulder epaulettes and things, that's what he looks like. And he yells out, Gustavus! I give him the old finger guns and toss him an apple. And he... <laughs> Catches the apple out of the air and he takes a big chomping bite out of it and then tosses it over to one of his uh, flunkies that are follow following him around. He says, this is a magnificent beast. And he comes up and presumes to start putting its hands on the stallion's mane. Ah, please do not touch. He puts his hands up, takes a step back. It's just, he goes, there's a lot of, uh, hmm. the lady who rode up on it. She was kind of decked out and, well, you know. It, he waves everything you're saying away. He says, never mind that. I find I have a need to travel in the near future. And I find myself flush with coin from <clears throat> recent fortunes. How much for the horse? I'll buy it from you. It is not mine to sell. I'll give you 80 pieces of gold. It's not mine to sell. 90 pieces. <laughs> There's a very fine stable over in some other part of the city. I This horse is not mine to sell. And he says he's been to all the stables in Wharf Town and the Shallows, Quarry Town. He says this is the most magnificent beast in the city. He well, says he can part with 100 pieces of gold. And I'm going to say, I'm sorry, but this is not my horse to sell. What's the manner of your speech? Pat, uh, just, uh, neutral. 
I'm not threatening or anything. Okay. This is not my horse. Just repeating, this is not my horse. So, kind of like a customer service voice. He uh, reaches up and wipes the apple juice out of his beard. You can see he's starting to get annoyed. He tells you, all right, I'll tell you what. 105 pieces of gold. <laughs> and I'll be sure to tell the gentleman that you're still a team player. We wouldn't want the gentleman to think you're not a team player, would we, Gustavo? And at this, he reaches down to his coin pouch. And it's bulging and flush with coin. Uh, and he goes, excuse me, but I don't remember your name. But please, this is not my horse to sell. So, I didn't give you this character's name, but this is somebody you've met before. Do you legitimately want to not remember this guy's name? Oh, well, okay. No, I, I remember his name. Okay. Like, like, this is not my horse to sell. Like, is this somebody, like, like this is probably somebody Gus would have, doesn't like. This was somebody on Gus's level back when he worked with the gentleman. Right. And like, Gus one of his did not like him. Probably, probably not. Did, did not like him. This is not my horse to sell. And then I'm going to add, piss off. And at that, his flunkies kind of ooh and ah a little bit. He goes, you are not the gentleman, and you do not have the power to invoke the gentleman's name. Well, he'll be hearing about this, that's for sure. And he makes a big show of kicking the dust with his boot, and this cloud of dust kicks up on one of these horses' legs. So it's probably lame anyway. Come on, boys, let's get back. And he turns his heel and starts stomping down the road. I'm going to reach uh, into the pouch, take out an apple, and just uh, it's a and say one for the road, and kind of just just underhanded easy toss it to him. I mean, his back is to you at this point. Is your your intent to pelt him with this apple? No, but if that's what happened, that's what happens. Are you trying to hit him with the apple? Nope. Okay, so the apple lands in the ground behind him. And he turns around with just this mean and vulgar look on his face. Like, that's the I, tough that you knew. That's, I that's give him, the man. I give, I give him the old finger guns. And he <laughs> spits on the apple and continues down the road. And after a few moments, one of the children nearby runs over and snatches it up. I reach into the, the satchel and whistle at, the, uh, whistle at the, the child. And I pull out, like, just an armful of apples. And I, and I hand them to the children and wink at them. And all of these then, children are having the best apples of their lives. Right. Have you and given any I... to the horse? <laughs> <laughs> no. You gotta talk to that horse. Find out that it's pissed. <laughs> <laughs> Give away all my apples. What a dickhead. Yeah, the horse is like, alright man, what a... you don't have to be a dick about it. Like the guy was just... <laughs> He wasn't doing nothing to you. I'll give the horse. I'll give the horse an apple because he kind of, you know, that guy kicked dirt on him. He so, didn't deserve it. My name's Mike, by the way. <laughs> like the horse. Glad you deign, like sir. <laughs> this will surely fill my empty belly today. This horse probably eats better than we do. Hush. <laughs> oh yes, for sure. And then I'm gonna pull out another apple and start eating it. Seeker <laughs> and Lucius. Come back into the room holding the box. Yep. It's done. And she takes the box and she wraps it back up in brown paper. Uh, she regards Alex for the moment. Mm-hmm. And she says, forgive me, I don't know you by reputation outside of your role in Flumpf Inc. Do you have any family who fought in the wars. I uh, believe my grandfather and my father both did. She says, allow me to offer my apologies. It's possible that Oh, wait, your grand- second, Um, I just remembered deep gnomes live much less long than other gnomes, so it'll just be his grandfather and his grandmother. Okay. Yeah, she says she, uh, she offers apologies says that it's possible that your grandparents were her enemy in those days. That she took the lives of no small number of deep gnomes. Her people fought on the side of a powerful, illithid psionicist. 
This is well, where I personally have never had anything against dark elves. Is what? What do you prefer? She smiles a little, as though she's sad to hear you say that. She says, "Me." I'll I use the, I'll use the server bin, surf neblin word for drow. Actually, in the, in while I'm speaking, she says that you say that, but have you? And forgive my presumption, but have you visited the land of your people? Have you actually been there? Oh yeah, lots. And have you met my people on the field of battle before? There's been peace this past, what has it been, like 50, 60 years? Right. No. She says that but for a misfortunate curse, she would be there still. This is where she learned her magic. This is where she amassed her wealth. And there's no few channels to gain further wealth and power in drow society the curse that's been placed upon her which is the secret that she cannot share with you until you share yours first and at this point you've noticed that the brown parcel is well on her side of the room and she has an entire arm draped over it and the wine glass in the other hand she says the nature of her curse because she uh had a powerful drow nemesis, a priestess, back during the wars. She was cursed that through action or inaction, she is magically incapable of ending a life. She can no longer kill. Hmm. As such, there's no place for her in drow society. She spent decades looking for a way to reverse this misfortune. And having found none, she decided to turn her attentions to the Sunlit Lands. When you enter a contract with me, it's important that you know the nature of the person that you're placing on the... Eventually placing on the Council of Lords in Dunfoss. You'll be a vote for peace, is what you're saying. You could not argue for war. She says, would she argue for war, war would not happen. Oh, so you can't, even if you attempt to. That's interesting. Hmm. She tells you that the the, the great amounts of experimentation have been done with the nature of this curse. Some of which uh, might not be fit for the ears of current company. But she's willing to tell you any particulars you feel you need to know. I mean, Alex just shrugs. Does that include your own life? She says that it does. Figured. At any rate, I don't generally view Drow themselves as, you know, evil or bad or anything that people will tell you. But there are definitely a lot that you don't want to cross in the dark alley. So. I have a couple questions. No hard feelings. (laughs) Of course Seeker has questions. So you were saying that if you were to argue for war, that would mean war wouldn't happen? Does that mean that arguing for war is your best way of stopping a war? She tells you that to think of the nature of a drow curse, you have to think of a a very twisted nature indeed. For example, is there a knife or some kind of blade in the room, a letter opener or something? Pass her dagger. Sure. She motions towards some sharp object. Yeah. If you hand her a dagger, she turns it over in her hand with her elbow resting on the box. She says, if I were to lunge across the room and place this dagger into your heart, sure, you would be unable to stop me from doing so. Okay. And my aim would not be called into question, nor my speed, nor my technique. However, you would miraculously survive the stabbing. Okay. Were the dagger to be poisoned, which, if it were one of mine, it certainly would be. Sure. You would linger to life for years in agony, not able to die. Though you would... Hand you one of your daggers. She says that the sunlit lands are not a place for... The types of war wars raged in 
the Underdark. And she would shudder to think at what would happen if she took a hand in starting such a war. A war without death would be no less abominable in its own way. Or perhaps nothing would happen at all. And she flings the dagger back to you. And peace would break out. I don't know. All right. So, what do we have here? It sounds to me like... I don't know about the rest of you, but I don't have any moral compunctions about this. This sounds fine to me. You said you would be a loyal wife. I have no reason to doubt you. Anyone have any issues? I have no objection. No, do I mean, like don't want to don't want to advertise it, but 20 years. What was the question? How do you plan on like, keeping the charade up for 15 to 20 years? <laughs> she tells you that the payment she's offering, this 500 gold that you stand to make, is a pittance compared to the power of the ally you will make. And this will be the first of many jobs. Many webs will have to be woven over in the in the near and far future. And if you, prove, my mind, yeah. if you prove yourself trustworthy, she sees Flumph Incorporating taking a very large role in many of those tasks. On top of that, she is a skilled magician. She has many magical secrets. Some older and darker than any wizard in Dunfoss would know. And that over time, these resources could perhaps be made available to you. These are the things that she's going to bend into, as you say, keeping up the charade. I guess I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, if it's not too forward, how exactly do you intend to deal with the magical colleges here? Like, you don't want to be associated with one of them. Are you going to create your own? Are you going to supplant one? Are you going to get inside one and subvert it? Or are you just going to be an off-the-books off wizard? She hasn't decided yet. Okay. But she definitely likes that you had the presence of mind to ask. <laughs> Look, I'm... Lucius if you want to take over Yolari had... and maybe, like, get rid of a couple of their monthly rituals, I'm all for it. She says she has absolutely no interest in Yolari. Me either. <laughs> you have a lot in common with this Dark Elf. What was Lucius's question? Well, Lucius's question is more, more of a more of kind of a personal thing like like he noticed like i noticed that you took uh, the, the disguise of a sand elf here and uh if if you if you're interested i can i could teach you some of the i, I i'm from romneus myself and i've spoken with many with many sand elves in in discussions and magical forms and such in uh in 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 kiska and i'd be more than happy to give you some uh give you some pointers on on the sand elf language to more appropriately blend in as it were she asks if she were to take you up on that offer whether she would be more convincing as a typical sand elf to the people of dunfoss it couldn't hurt she asks afterwards if the people of dunfoss would find it suspicious that a typical sand elf would cross the ocean and seek a husband here. And an interest in Dunfoss in politics and magic. <laughs> I mean, it might... It might help the ruse if they think that you're, you know, dis disaffection, disassociated with your old home. Like, it might not. I don't, I don't think either way would necessarily help or hurt, but it might change the way that you want to approach it. Although, if you're saying it's a calculated eccentricity, I fully respect that. She says she doesn't see any problems in tricking the people of Dunfoss into believing anything. The most uh, uh, perilous part of this journey is the beginning. And for now, what she, all she needs is to land this rich husband so that she can stake her claim here without anybody actually knowing that she was shopping around. It, she of needs a marriage course. of convenience... Like she needs, she needs to be a gold digger without anybody knowing that's what's happening. Right? Yeah, yeah. I got that. Because you've already shown us one secret-based magical artifact. Do you have any others that would come in handy of us trying to find someone who had no connections to the college magic? She smiles, and for a moment, <laughs> the uh, the cheery disposition 
comes back into her face. She says, if I had such an artifact, I would have no need of flump ink. So, just shrugs. He's not going to turn down a, a, something if it's an option. He'll always ask. <laughs> here's, here, here's, oh, God. Interrupted my train of thought. Now I can't remember what the hell I was going to say. Frustrated. Sorry. Um, see, it was, I was going to ask, uh, if she was. Oh, right. Uh, uh, our mutual friend, Mr. Fireblood, he, did he, uh, how much of this have you told him? For all the, uh, after all, a secret plan is only as secret as the, um, something or other. I've, words are hard for me right now. She says that Corio knows nothing. Okay. He knows her name. He knows that she's wealthy. He knows that she's from across the ocean. All right. I just... Just saying that loose lips often do sink ships. And that she pats the box and says that she trusts there are none on this barge. So what happens next? Do we draft a paper contract? Do I sign my name to something? Do I Given press... that you want to make sure that this remains, you know, off the books... Or, not off the books. We're not doing anything illegal here, but given that you want to make sure that this remains out of the public's attention, uh, the contract will be drafting for us to require certain magical reagents for experimentation. Uh, alchemical, actually, because those aren't illegal uh, without a College of Magic supervision. And she says, excellent. Draft it, and I'll sign whatever you need to. Yep. Speaking of that, would you mind an alchemist? They're not affiliated with College of Magic, you're saying? Seeker says, looking over. <laughs> She says she'll consider any list of prospects that you bring her. Yeah, and I'll write up a contract stating that we're looking for roughly 500 gold pieces worth of specific, rare, hard-to-find alchemical components. Okay. She puts her name to it. So the contract is... Uh, you can figure out how you're going to actually draft it. Uh, mm -hmm. She's going to pay you 200 gold for a list of names of potential marriage candidates, 300 more upon successful marriage. Yep, it's 200 gold to find the reagents and 300 more of her if they are successful in whatever reaction she's trying to perform with them. Sounds good. Just hopefully, you better hope that your taxman doesn't look too deeply into the situation. But I'm sure the taxmen treat you fairly. I'm assuming that a magical drow elf can lie just as well as we can when it comes to tax time. And Seeker she, never assumes that anyone can lie as well as he can. She entrusts Seeker with a box and bids him to carry it back up to her horse so that she might be on her way. As soon as Gus sees them come out of the thing, he's going to throw the apple he was eating as far as he could and shoo the children away. <laughs> Make a persuasion check at disadvantage. You gotta persuade these children to leave the place where they know the delicious apples are. Uh, that is... That is a 16. A 16? What do you tell them will happen if they don't shoo? Uh, that we weren't supposed to be eating the apples, and the lady's coming back. Go, go, go. Okay. So you shoo them away. Is Seeker, are you taking the box back up? Yeah. Okay. As Seeker reaches the top, Daisy comes up behind him. Thanks, Gus, for watching after her stallion and uh, congratulates him on doing such an excellent job. Before she goes, I will tell her about the, uh, to like, uh, one of the, like, I'll ask her if she knows who the gentleman is. I know many gentlemen. Anyway, uh, a thug with more money than sense came from and i'll point at the wharf that way and he wanted to buy your horse and i would not let him so just be aware of there he might try some kind of reprisal or well, well, local criminal masterminds well thank goodness you were here otherwise he would have simply taken the horse and not made an offer at all i was correct to entrust my valuable property to you and you've done an admirable job mm -hmm. and i'll give her the old finger guns and climb down the ladder <laughs> Go some of the finger guns today. 
Every time I hear the finger guns, my, like, my soul dies a little each time. I, I'm going to start making... Finger gun. Thank you. Now I'm going to make pew noises when I do it. Good job. <laughs> it occurs to me that I should have made these apples do something silly when you eat them. <laughs> like... They give you the undeniable urge to do finger guns. That's okay. I would have known that the apples were enchanted. Like they're a very, they're a very strong horse aphrodisiac or something. Horse fucker, horse fucker. <laughs> and yes, she rides away. <sighs> and you guys fill Gus in on the nature of the contract that you signed with her. On the way down, I pull an apple out and hand it to Seeker. <laughs> Seeker eats it. Because I've got like, like. I stuffed my bag full. So like <laughs> So like this is Gus now. He's holding all these apples. Hey, uh, Seeger, you think you could press to digitation one of these later? If we got some crab apples? Seeger points a finger gun at him, cast message and says, You betcha. <laughs> these are pretty good. Everybody take an apple. I can hear him the Everybody take voice. a finger gun. <laughs> All right, so Seeker and I are going to head out in the morning. we we'll probably be gone about a day and a half. Uh, Seeker, do you have a pony or something? No, I have nothing. Okay. Hey. Do you want me to come with you? I I will finish my scroll tonight and come with you if you want. Do we want to buy horses? Buy? Or rent? Mm -hmm. See, I I have a request of Gus's assistance to bring back one of those chain creatures. Yeah, we're just buy we're just picking up a gun. I don't think it'll be too dangerous. I got Seeker with me. So we're splitting up. You and Seeker are going to meet Dino Stomper, was it? Dino yeah. Stomper. Dino Stomp. Uh Gus and L Lucius are traveling north back to the horrible Dragon Cave? I feel like you're going to need a... You're going to need a cart and multiple horses to do that? That we cage wasn't some, small. We got, some, we got some coin for our uh, for our troubles. At oh, yeah, we do have we some gems to sell. Uh, about the coins that we found, we should probably smelt them down to bars or something so that they don't have an evil god's insignia on them that the authorities had previously destroyed a temple to that might raise some questions. So we want to, so we've got, all right, so we have a uh, hundred gold, no, 500 gold pieces and gems, the 80 gold coins that we're talking about smelting down, which I could probably find you guy in Gnome Town to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, we also have five maces and longbows to possibly sell. I'm confused as to why we're going back to the dragon cave again. Have I missed something? Tom Wolf wanted... knows a guy who knows a guy that would like a living specimen of one of those bear traps you were fighting. All right. Okay. So you guys yeah. were going to take the cage that you had from Warlock Spain and travel north. You were going to capture one while you were up there before you made friends with a black dragon and things got real. Yeah. What I would like to do for the rest of the day, I have two things I'd like to do, Brick. Let me know if sure. I can accomplish these. I would like to build the two metal linings for the boxes and then put on my hat, go underwater, and add the lead linings to those boxes. And then B, I would like to start building a six-horse hitch for the above the stair, for above the ladder. Okay. I've when got you retrieve tools. the boxes out of the water, <laughs> what do you what, what, you retrieve them and bring them back up onto the barge? No, I want to open the 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 iron boxes I built to hold the smaller magical boxes. Okay. And I want to add lead linings. Now I will be f fabricating my lab. <laughs> Whether or not you believe me is up to you. But weeks mm -hmm. and many sessions ago, when you first got these boxes, yeah, <clears throat> I made a roll to see how long they would hold up before bad things happened. That's why I won't send someone down to check on them today. <laughs> And he checked on them by looking at them, giving them finger guns, and then swimming away. <laughs> right. I shit you not, on today's the 11th, on the 13th, crazy bullshit was going to explode out of these boxes. 
I have been hope like they're they're all leaving town again to go off and do shit. They're gonna come back and everything's gonna have blown up while they were gone. <laughs> Okay. Is that apparent to me when I get down there with my lead lining? Yes, when you get into the outer metal box, a great gout of steam is released, and the water kind of flash boils around the box. It gets extremely hot to the point where if you try to handle it uh, unsafely, it's going to scald you. And you realize okay. that the boxes themselves are bulging at the sides. Okay, a boarding mission with the iron, swing back up and yelling, Seeker! Yeah. We got a problem. Bring it to the temple of God's Winter Gold. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll swim over to the, to the barge and pull myself up. To be clear, All right. Seeker wants to deliver a bomb to the church. Okay. As a you know those... The magical boxes we secured underwater? Yeah. That's not holding. They're ready to go. Um, I need... I think you need to put on this hat and levitate them up, and then we need to do something to get rid of them. Well, so there's two ways we can go with that. Yeah. I can't this even touch them This box is right not now. holding, and we're gonna need to get rid of it, right? Fireworks? Well, sure. <laughs> I was thinking we can use levitate to bring it up. Yep. Or we could use levitate to bring it down. It's already at the bottom of the water, Seeker. So we go a little bit further out to where it's just a little bit deeper, push it way down deep there. And detonate it? it Call it a day. How do we even open it up, though? I, I, Are I, these boxes that could be mage-handed open? Yeah, probably. Okay. Uh, there's only one hat, so you're going to have to do that on your own. Now sure. I can be I can be swimming above you with cure wounds ready in case something goes wrong. Yeah, I mean I think it's going to cause a tremendous magical explosion. So if you had some sort of fire resistance, that one. Yeah, I can do that. A mess. Yeah. Uh, can I do that today? I can. I can. Yeah. So why don't I get on a why don't I get on a dinghy or something? Head out. We'll go maybe. To the point where it's about 100, 200 feet deep. You bring the boxes down. You mage hand them open. I'll be about 50 feet back on the surface. And uh, we don't cause a commotion. Yep. <clears throat> Do you tell the other three what you're doing? Yeah. 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 Do you guys have anything to say about this? Good luck. This feels like it's going to cause a commotion. I, I, have, I have nothing but confidence in the lot of you. Does what's that thing called where like you know like like the the ocean floor just gets it just just sheer cliffs and then like it's like super the deep. abyssal plane <laughs> no. the abyssal shelf? depths it's yeah the shelf the continental yeah. shelf yeah the continental shelf like is there a continental shelf we could just push it off nearby there is well, but actually, you're not gonna be taking a dinghy out there I have a question yeah surely this has come up in the past where like stuff has needed to be disposed of within the city. What what is the legal ramifications of to do a magically a magical disposal within the city grounds? Magic bomb disposal. Uh, hire somebody to try to cast to spell magic comes to mind. Uh, Absolutely. So we hired ourselves. <laughs> if you think it's too dangerous, you can try to contact maybe the black jackets or the some researchers at Tylestus Apt, somebody in the palace, and tell them, hey, we we. we think this magical artifact might be of danger and then hope that they don't blame you for it. Hey, as a member of Tylesness Apt, would you say that disposing of this underneath the uh, water away from the city was a good decision? Who are you asking? I'm not a representative. I'm only a member. Just a, as a member. We don't know a representative. And I will be the first to tell you that a member of the guild in good standing is always a representative of their guild. <laughs> you I have things that I need to do and you <laughs> I mean aside from maybe some I hate to say it but dolphin fuckers I don't think anyone in Yolari would care. <laughs> All right, so the Yolari agree that this is a 
a necessary economic or a necessary <laughs> ecological problem that needs I to mean, be I mean, they'd with. like lay out a bunch of wreaths and you dance around it with a sickle, but they wouldn't actually do anything real about it because, you know. I, we got one of you truthers over there to tell us that we're not doing this under false pretenses. Vessel, I just want you to know, back in the 90s, I read one of those terrible Forgotten Realms novels uh -huh. about one of the Darganesti. Uh -huh. And she was able to turn into a dolphin. Uh -huh. And there was a scene in the book where she no. had sex with a guy who could also turn into a dolphin. Oh. So no, while they were dolphins? I think that was the implication. <sighs> I read The Magicians. <laughs> I was just thinking of that one episode of The Venture Brothers. I read a lot of those books and very few of them were good. So, okay. I, I, will, I will tell you as a member of the Diviners Guild that I foresee great danger within the next, oh, say, two days if we were to leave the sea. <laughs> yeah, so let's let's make sure we're not under a shipping lane. So let's the plan is to... Of the city. How far away are you taking the dinghy from the city? Let me... Uh, eye shot. With an eye shot? Well, I mean, shot. how long did it take me to build the metal... Uh, containers a couple hours probably a couple of hours uh so we're getting close to sunset i'd say for the first one let's just let's just go until we're at until sunset well how i have things i want to do today how long can you levitate something about 10 minutes not that so long yeah, let's do let's do 10 minutes okay yeah so you're still gonna be relatively close to the city and what is seeker doing down there are you just going to use mage i'm gonna and... push it down as far as i can with levitate and then open it up with Mage Hand and continue pushing it away. Okay. I'm about 50 feet back above him. And to at be the clear, top I'm resistant to fire right now, Cecil. <laughs> uh, I can be as a reaction. Okay. Uh, Seeker? So I need you both to make me... Where are you getting fire resistance from? Let's start there. Uh, I can cast Absorb Elements. So you've cast that on Seeker? No. No. I can cast Resorb Elements. I don't know about Seeker. Okay. So, Seeker, are you resistant to fire, and if so, how? I, I, my understanding was that he was going to cast it on me. That's why I asked him. It feels like you have misunderstood. <laughs> that, that's... No, it's a, it's his personal spell. It's a self. So why? The one when I asked that... What? I thought you meant, was I? Could I be resistant to fire? I don't care if you're resistant <laughs> to fire. You can burn for all I care. <laughs> So, I need both of you. I'm going to let you kids sort this out. I will be back in a moment. You need to make dexterity saving throws, but for different reasons. Yeah. I rolled a 20. I don't know about you. Destiny, you're on your own. <laughs> Out of 15. 15? Uh, okay, how much friggin' damage does the unresistant seeker take? Seeker. Oh, real quick question before this, because yeah. it might be very relevant in the next two seconds. <laughs> uh, during the two days that we were, went back to hell, uh, town, did my health come back? Yes, if you take it a long rest in the inter in the time being. Fantastic. Eight points of fire damage, which you can cut in half because this is happening underwater, and then you can cut in half again because you passed the save. Right. As unbelievably hot, scalding water. For a moment submerged down in the water. You're using your levitate spell to like push these boxes down, yes? Yeah. Uh, you see the flames lick up through the water. You've seen a lot of crazy stuff in your life. Some of it you've caused. Some of it happened because of Garl Glitter Gold. This is the first time you've ever seen active fire underwater. And they take the shape of great hands fanning out from the opening of the box where your mage hands lifted the, uh, the hatch. Yeah. But they cannot withstand the water and the pressure, and they fizzle out after a moment. And the cavity it leaves in the water, it just boils away a huge bubble that starts ascending to the surface. And it's this bubble passing by you that sends this wave of scalding hot water in your direction that deals very little damage. How did Alex do on his deck save? 15. This bubble erupts at the surface of the water and it throws a great wave in all directions and your boat manages not to throw you overboard 
And then after a few moments, things seem calm. Speaker paddles back up to the surface, slightly red, and says, All right, well, that was safely disposed of. <laughs> yep, good job. All right, we're going to go ahead and take a take our break here. Uh, any bookwork stuff that you want to do, uh, purchasing horses or whatever, before the two groups of you set back out, go ahead and do that in the interim. When we come back, we will all you guys can leave Dunfoss again and go do random stuff. Did can you I say sell... you were purchasing yourself a horse or a pony? I have uh, Scrappy. Um, can I sell the longbows and maces at half cost without having to deal with anything? Yeah, that's fine with me. And gems at full cost? Uh, say gems at 70%. Okay. 